welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a stroke survivor and grateful recovering alcoholic. Today, I'm going to talk about unhealthy, persistent illusions. Um, But before I do that, I wanted to let you know that I made some sourdough bread. Um, I started last night and baked it this morning and it turned out perfect. So I'm three for three. I've done the pretzels and the bagels and the sourdough bread. So next is snowball cookies. That's what I'm doing next. They're like powdered sugar cookies. That's what I'm doing. So who would have thought I've got this baking, um, skill that I didn't know that I had. And I've also started cutting the material for my quilt. So um, unfortunately, that it turns out hurts my head, which I was not expecting, because sewing doesn't hurt my head. But what's happening is I have uh, to measure the squares. So each square has to be like five by five inches. So I have like a big, it's called a fat quarter and I put it down and I'm cutting it with a rotary blade, but, um, I have to line it up. And so I have to focus a little more than what I had. Uh, I don't know. I guess I didn't think it through, (laughs) but I've done half of them and I'm just doing it and taking breaks. So I found a way to uh, set it up so that I only have to really focus on the measurements once instead of doing each line and measuring. So it's going a little bit faster. Once I can get through that, then it won't hurt my head as much. It doesn't seem to hurt my head to just sew the pieces together, but that focusing on the little lines in order to measure it, that seems to be an issue. So there's your update on um, hobbies, Rachel's hobbies. So today um, I wanted to talk about this, this idea that I keep having that I'm normal. (laughs) And that sounds weird, but meaning... I just can't seem to get it through my thick skull that I cannot do things that other people can do. I just do it. I guess because I've lived 49 years doing it. So uh, to be, you know, to have a phone in somebody else's hand and they're watching a video that I want to see maybe, uh, you know, my son is on the video or something. I want to look at it, you know, so it's hard for me to fight that urge to look at it. And so I spent some time drawing that same parallel that I do between um, my stroke recovery and my sobriety. And so I'm just going to talk through that and, and we'll see where we end up. So when I first was getting ready to enter into sobriety, there's this shift, this decision that you have to make. And so it's that willingness to admit that I'm an alcoholic that I'm different, that once I admit that I'm different, that I can't drink like everybody else, that I'm an alcoholic, then that's it. That means I knew, uh, maybe I didn't know thoroughly, but I knew that that meant I was going to be an alcoholic for the rest of my life. And that is really, really difficult. So you can imagine it's when you're approached with having to make that decision, um, I was unwilling to admit it. And with the disease of alcoholism, it does not ever get better. 
it only gets worse. So, and it seems like, (laughs) and maybe it's just because you're paying closer attention, it seems like once you start getting into going to sobriety meetings, whether you're drinking or not, um, it gets even worse tenfold. I know for me, once I started going into these meetings and really almost trying to look away, but people kept, you know, I felt like people kept, you know, like, look at it, Rachel, look at it. Almost like, you know, you see something terrible and you want to look away, but somebody grabs your head and like forces you to look at it. That's what I felt like. And, um, once I was in that environment, it just got worse, uh, exponentially. So, um, and it, and it never gets better. I tried all different ways to control my drinking and, um, I wanted to drink like other people. So this is just another phase of it. If I could like put a, put like a timeline together that showed like, okay, I went through this first, then I tried to control my drinking and then I started to you know, uh, fight it. You know, if I could remember what that was like, I would plot it out. But it's so, such a blur back then. But I do remember clearly a phase where I had already gone to some meetings and was, I was told that the only way to stop, uh, the only way to what, what am I trying to say to, to get sober or to not be obsessed with drinking anymore is that you have to completely stop drinking. So a lot of people, when they get uh, told that they try to control their drinking and I, and I did the same thing. And it's interesting. We all try the same thing and we don't realize that each other tries this until we get into sobriety and we share our stories and we're all like, oh yeah, I did that too. Yeah, I did that too. So I tried to, I was very much a drinker of the Vela boxed Chardonnay and I used to put ice in it and I would just drink it like all day long. Um, and me putting ice in it was, I used to say it was like I was hydrating myself while I was drinking. Silly. Uh, And so when I was trying to start controlling my drinking, I switched over to beer because I didn't drink as much. Well, I didn't think I would drink as much beer. So I switched over to that. Well, that didn't work. I just, and it was creating a lot more recycling than I was willing to collect. And I would try not drinking until five o'clock in the afternoon I would try, uh, you know, not drinking until three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, once that time just kept getting pushed up and pushed up, then there was a point where I was uh, making sure I didn't drink before noon. And then uh, eventually it was all time, you know, 24 hours a day I was drinking. Um, So I just, I even... When I tried going to meetings, I would start getting the non-alcoholic wine or non-alcoholic beer. I tried that for a while, um, but I just couldn't control myself, which it sounds so weird to say that right now that I couldn't control myself. Like if you put a piece of chocolate in front of me, like I wouldn't be able to control myself and pick it up. Of course I could control myself and not pick it up. But with alcohol, I could not control myself. And it's just, it's fascinating that that compulsion to drink was so strong that it made me feel like I didn't have a choice to pick it up or not. So I was looking up what alcoholic thinking is because uh, I heard a lot about alcoholic thinking. And 
so I wanted to um to I guess try to make it I don't know try to talk about what that feels like what alcoholic thinking feels like because it very much is that compulsion it's that that lack of willingness to try to get better and so alcoholic thinking is is thought of to be like it's it's an obsession of the mind so it's a disease it's it's a disease of the body and an obsession of the mind or a sickness of the body and an obsession from the mind i think that's what they call it um and it causes chronic relapsing it causes a person to not be able to control or stop drinking despite whatever they're they're losing whether they're losing their um uh, their job their uh relationships um they could be uh you know their liver is shutting down they their body, you know, their organs are shutting down. They're in the hospital. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, they just can't stop. And um, so alcohol disrupts the nervous system. And uh, it's a depressant and disrupts your normal sensory input. Pretty much the way I look at it is that it made me crazy. <laughs> That's what it felt like. It felt like I was crazy. When I look back on the things that I said and did, I was crazy. I was not thinking reasonably. And what I've noticed or I've thought through since I've been sober is that it seems like many of the people who are alcoholics um well, I guess the more I know more sober alcoholics than I know active alcoholics. And it seems to me that many of them, the overwhelming majority, are very intelligent people. They're intellectuals. That's what it seems like to me that I've ob observed. And I've always had this feeling I don't know that I've shared this with anybody. I've had this feeling that these people, I mean, everybody, the disease of alcoholism is the disease of alcoholism. And all of our life experiences are the parts that are different. But the disease is the disease. And it seems to help people who think over time to settle their thinking. And I feel like, I know it's not, it doesn't apply in all cases, but it seems like these intellectuals who can't stop their slow down their brain, turn to alcohol to do it for them. And what ends up happening is, you know, if you've got the disease, it, it just continues to, like the amount of alcohol that you need just continues to grow and grow and grow. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's just something that maybe I, since I haven't told anybody before, I guess I'm having a hard time articulating it, but it seems very rational in the beginning until you're consuming so much alcohol that it's like you shift over into this, this world of insanity um, 
So there's a story in our sobriety program that I really like and that I heard this morning. And it has to do with this insanity, this this idea, this this alcoholic thinking that that is it's like an illusion like we like when we just can't grasp the idea that we're never gonna be able to drink again that we'll never be able to drink like another person again and there are people who stay sober for decades, you know, 45 years, and yet can go into a restaurant and be sitting next to somebody with a martini glass and an olive in the bottom and think, man, I would really like to have that olive. Why does that olive look so good to me? It's because it's been soaking in vodka. And and if that person of 45 years of sobriety were to reach for that olive and eat it, it's game over uh, because it never goes away. And not only is it game over, but most likely that person would start drinking again and it would be exponentially more dangerous, more deadly than it was 45 years earlier when they stopped drinking. That's the insanity of the disease and how even if I'm not drinking, I haven't drank for seven years, if I were to pick up a drink today, my disease still progressed seven years even though I didn't drink during it. So if I were to pick it up, I mean, it would be, it would be over. And that's, that's a lot of reason why uh, people pick up again and they, and they don't make it. So this story in the sobriety program is about a guy who goes out to, I guess, lunch or something. And he goes out to get a sandwich and a glass of milk for lunch. And he eats the sandwich and drinks the glass of milk. And then he's still hungry, so he orders another sandwich and another glass of milk. And so he finishes that, and it strikes him. He's been sober. It strikes him that if he were to put alcohol in his milk, he's got two sandwiches in his belly and two glasses of milk. If he were to put alcohol in another glass of milk, that it wouldn't hit him as much. So he orders it. And he realizes, well, that wasn't so bad. So he orders another one. And you know what happens next. You know, he ends up having uh, four whiskeys and milk and and then it's it's over. Um, so. Similarly, I what what this brought to mind today was during one of my many attempts to stop drinking. This is before I was really working a sobriety program. I went out to a Japanese restaurant with some neighbors of mine and I hadn't been drinking for like a week, I think. It was it was pretty good <laughs> actually. I was not happy, but I wasn't drinking. And that's what we call a dry drunk. That's so you're not drinking, but you're miserable is pretty much what that is. So I was, we were all sitting around and the chef was like throwing shit up in the air and stuff. And then you know how they grab like the squeegee bottle and start squirting it in people's mouth. It's alcohol in there. Well, I don't know. I wasn't thinking that it was alcohol in there. And and I I don't know why I would have thought it was water. I guess because I was thinking I was having a either I was being naive, which is probably most likely what it is, 
Or I was just in this non-alcoholic world and just assuming that, well, if I'm not drinking, nobody else is or something. Anyway, the guy squeezes the sake across the table into my mouth and and I'm like, oh my God, there was alcohol in there. And I was really kind of pissed that it just, you know, went into my mouth and come to think of it, I, well, I was, I was going to hold on. So I did, I ended up drinking after that. Okay. That's the end of that story, but come to think of it. When I first got out of detox, my biggest fear was that somehow alcohol was going to get in my mouth without me putting it in there. I wonder if that's why I was thinking that it just hit me. Why I've always thought that, like alcohol was going to jump out from behind a bush and <laughs> and go down my throat. I bet you that's why, because I ended up having that experience. Anyway, um, so then uh, recently I had the experience of going to make candles with a friend and it was super fun. And when we were... After we were done, we were walking around the shop and looking for things to buy because I was actually out in the world for once. This was uh, a few weeks ago. And so I wanted to like buy things. I bought some Christmas presents. And one of the ladies in the candle class came up to me and offered me a glass of wine because it was in those classes, you know, they... That's the highlight of them is that people can drink while they're doing it. So we weren't drinking, me and my friend, but the people next to us were. So they didn't finish their bottle. So they were offering me a glass of wine. And when I have to say no to somebody offering me a glass of wine, I feel super awkward. I feel like they think that anything of me, you know, that they think that, oh, well, she's, you know, what's wrong with her? That's really what I think. And it's, it just feels awkward. And I think it's because, because I care what they think. But I also feel like there's this lingering feeling that I'm ashamed that I'm different. And so fast forward to a couple days ago, I took my dog out over to the school to run around. And there were a couple other dog parents over there. And we were chit chatting about all the mosquitoes and stuff. And I said, Oh, well, you have to try this thing called a venom extractor. And it's, it's got like all these amazing reviews. And it's just this plastic, it looks like a kid's like playing doctor, like shot, plastic shot, like you would give somebody a shot. Um, it like a play toy. But it's called a venom extractor, and you put it on your mosquito bite. It sucks the venom out of the mosquito bite. It takes like 30 seconds. Um, I put it on there for a minute. but and, and your mosquito bites won't itch anymore. It's fascinating. It works every time I use it. So we have like three of them. So I'm telling them about that because I see the guy is standing there. He's got mosquito bites all over his legs and I say and I didn't bring it up they brought it up and the lady next to me had a huge welt on the side of her leg from mosquito bites I was like you guys have to get the venom extractor and they were like what is that so the lady goes on her phone and is looking up I said it's on Amazon so she's looking it up I'm like it's in a like a lime green case and it's got um, different tips for it. And she's looking it up and she shows me her phone and says, is this it? And I said, no, that's not it. And I'm looking right at her phone and she just scrolls right in front of me, scrolls her phone in my face. 
And I was like, huh! and I like reacted, audibly reacted and pulled my head away because I cannot do that. It was like she might as well have just slapped me because that's how instantaneous it, it, it hurts my head like that. And, um, and I just made, I felt again, super awkward that I was like, I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. And then she, I don't know, showed it to me again or something. And it was on the screen. I said, yeah, that's it. And I just felt terrible. And so I ended up leaving the school and I never told them what the problem was. And they probably think she's the freak who, <laughs> who couldn't look at the phone or, or freaked out at my phone. But it's that feeling of being different, you know, like I don't want to be different. It's, it's how far do you go when you're explaining to somebody that you can't do something like when that lady offered me a glass of wine, how far do I go to say, no, I can't drink that? No, I am allergic to alcohol. No, thank you. You know, no, thank you is the easier way. Um, but when you just say no, thank you, that gives me that that other feeling, which is my own problem, which is like, oh, they're going to think that I'm, you know, what's wrong with her, that thing. Um, and that's my own problem that I need to, I, I need to work on and I will work on. Um, but it's just, it's persistent. That's, that's what I'm talking about with this, the title of this, this, um, unhealthy, persistent illusion that I'm like everybody else and I'm not like everybody else. You know, I'm always talking about in the episodes how, yeah, we all think we're, we're unique and we're not unique. Well, we're not unique. And, you know, I'm not unique in that there are other people who are alcoholics like me. There are other people who have uh, neurological vision impairment like me. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I rarely find in my circle people like me. I don't know. I, you know, I know uh, maybe a couple alcoholics in my day-to-day -day life that that. I don't know through my program that have their own, you know, that, that are also involved in the program, but I didn't meet them through the program. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to continue to be confident and hold your chin up high when sometimes you just want to be like other people. And so I did an episode on setting boundaries and, and I think that that's what this brings me back to again is, is setting up these boundaries, um, to protect myself from myself, protect myself from, from my own alcoholic thinking, because 45 years from now, when I'm sitting in a restaurant next to somebody else who's drinking and I see an olive in the leftover in their martini glass, I need to make sure that just as much as I know today or am confident today, just as much as I was in my first year of sobriety, I need to make sure that I remind myself that I'm an alcoholic, you know, that I was thinking about how when I was a trainer, training is exhausting. Training is, I, w I would, 
compare it to being a school teacher where it's very different in my opinion than from from any other job sorry i just hit the microphone from any other job where you have to be on constantly like all day long you have to be on you have to be reactive responsive um you have to be present and by the end of the day you know i I really was introduced to how these school teachers must feel at the end of the day because I'm dealing with adults where, you know, honestly, sometimes the adults aren't any better than the children, but it's exhausting. And over over the the first maybe couple years, uh definitely the first year of my sobriety, I felt exhausted. Like I felt like I constantly had my guard up. Like I was constantly protecting myself, actively protecting myself from myself, protecting myself from my environment and making sure that that drink didn't jump out from behind the bush at me. And I feel like right now in this stroke recovery that I'm in that same phase where I am constantly on guard and that I'm protecting myself from the pain in my head getting triggered because right now I am still trying to figure out what hurts my head. Just like today when I was cutting these, the quilting, um, material, I didn't know it was going to hurt my head until it started hurting my head. And so I, I feel exhausted. (laughs) I feel exhausted. And that's fine. That's fine. That's why I'm doing the podcast. That's why I'm taking naps. That's why I'm, I'm continuing to actively fight for myself because it's exhausting Um, And I need to make sure that I stay on constantly until I get comfortable in this new normal that I have. But I want to also work on not being ashamed of protecting my health. And I want to accept I want to have the willingness to accept every day and I don't yet that I am unable to do things that normal people can do I don't want to have daily feelings of irritability that I can't do it I don't know if one day I'm going to be able to do it. And by it, I mean any of the, anything, anything, drive, let's say drive again. I, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it, but I'm tired of being irritated that I can't do it. And I am tired of having this persistent illusion that I'm going to do it. Or this illusion that some days I think that I can do it. Like I was thinking I would love to go get a massage. My neck is killing me and my head is killing me. And and for an instant, I'm like, oh, I can drive myself. No, I can't. Well, I don't want to ask my boyfriend to have to drive me over there. Maybe I could. No, I don't want to ask, you know. And then I just don't do it. And that is that is probably what's happening, happening to me the most right now is that I'm not doing things because either it's going to hurt my head or I don't want to bother somebody else. I got invited to go to Home Goods today by my boyfriend for the past two days. And I'm like, 
you know what? I just can't do it. I said yes yesterday and then I had to back out because I just can't do it. It's not worth it. It hurts. And so the answer for me that I have been slowly coming to is that I need to slow down and I need to be patient. There are some things that I can't do, but if I slow down and I get patient, I can find an alternative. And an example of that would be voiceover you know, going on the internet, on my Mac. I was super frustrated a month ago because I couldn't go on my Mac. I just bought this Mac, by the way, <laughs> not too long ago. I, and I couldn't go on my Mac. But when I slowed down and I realized I've got nothing but time, then... I started to learn it and I started real, you know, realizing that there are alternative ways for me to do these things. And the sourdough bread that I made, I think I left out the most important and exciting part about making that sourdough bread. And that is that I did it all by listening to the recipe using voiceover. So using my finger and reading the recipe and or having it read to me. Um, and I didn't mess it up. Like it came out, it came out good. And I did it all without looking, using my eyes with the recipe. And that's, that's because I'm willing to slow down. And I'm willing to slow down because I'm starting to practice acceptance. So I do keep getting constant reminders that nothing has changed. And those reminders happen when I try to do things anyway. That I'm like, oh, I'll just look for a second. You know, I'll just look at my phone for a second. And then my head hurts. Um, so I have those constant reminders and that's because the, in those instances, I'm not practicing acceptance. So I need to focus daily on how to pro approach each day. And I think lately I've been soaring into the future and all the uncertainty that, that I see when I look far ahead is makes me so antsy. It makes me want to freaking <laughs> rip my face off. It makes me want to run down the street. And when I have those feelings, I'm acknowledging now that that's energy. That is energy that needs to get out of me. And the way that I get it out of me is I get my yoga mat out. I get my weights out. So I must fully concede to my innermost self that I am disabled right now. And that just sounds so weird. But you know what? It sounds just as weird as it did when I said, I'm Rachel and I'm an alcoholic. I that I you know I can say it all day long now. I'm not a, I'm not embarrassed. It's it's who I am now. And even if I'm not always disabled uh, because there's always going to be that hope at least right now I have to fully concede that I am disabled. And so I'm going to try to have that. It sounds really, I don't know, it sounds heavy. It sounds thick. It sounds difficult to say those words um, because it sounds permanent. 
And, um, but I'm going to practice it because it might give me some of the help that I need to accept what I'm, the position I'm in right now and, and how to approach each day. So, whew, that's what I have. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you tomorrow.